Well, howdy. You doing okay this morning, family? Good. It's so good to see you as we are kicking off a brand new teaching starting today that will take us up right before Thanksgiving called Just Like Barnabas. If you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it for me and turn to the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We'll be diving in there in just a moment to talk about this idea that we're going to begin starting today for the next few weeks about a particular person in Scripture named Barnabas. Now, before I tell you about Barnabas, I need to tell you why this is such an important topic. In fact, this is such an important topic, and you already know the reason why. This is such an important topic because before I even tell you the topic, you know what is going on in our world that would precipitate us having a family conversation for the next few weeks. And here's, here's sort of the reason why we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about. Here it is. Are you ready? Our world is a depressing place to be. Amen? It's full of depressed people doing depressing things, and often the news we see, the news we feel, if we are not thoughtful, it's simply a never-ending stream of what is wrong with the world, not what could be right with the world. Let me give you a few depressing facts to go with the depression that so many people feel. In fact, in fact, the world is discouraged, depressed, and in despair, and for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what an antidote to that can be, but let me give you a few facts. According To some of the latest information and research, 16 million plus Americans struggle with depression, clinical depression, every year. And by the way, if we were to include simply people who feel discouraged, that number would go from 16 million to every person in this room and around this country. According to the CDC, one out of every 10 adults has dealt with or will deal with some form of clinical depression in their life. And to add to that, do you want to know what the number one prescribed medication is in America? Antidepressants. If you want to be depressed, it doesn't take much to find a place to be depressed or discouraged. All you have to do is listen to the political scene. Regardless of if you're left-wing, right-wing, we're all part of the same broken bird. Amen? So whether it's politics, whether it's the economy, whether it's society, whether it's even your family, and, and we can't even escape discouragement when we go online. I know we think social media should be the one safe place. <laughs> But as we know, it's not safe either from discouragement and discouraging things, as many of you saw last month. Facebook was caught hiding some of its findings that, shocker of all shocks, its social media platform, both Facebook and especially Instagram, cause depression and discouragement. They found not just among all people although it does, but even especially among young ladies, teenagers. In fact, quote, they found that body image issues worse for one in three teenage girls when they use the Instagram app. Another report said 32% of teen girls said that when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made them feel worse. In other words, wherever you turn, if you want to, you can receive a steady diet of discouragement and feel depressed. Now, the word discourage simply means, and it comes from an old French word, but it simply means to lose heart, to have your heart taken away, your spirit, your vitality, your ability to face tomorrow today. And how many of us know that in a world that wants to take your heart The truth of Scripture that says, take heart, for I have overcome the world is a valuable truth. And the people of God who know the truth of God and convey the truth of God in an encouragement-centered way, how many of us know that they are the all-stars of the Christian faith? And so today, as we look at some difficult truths, I want to invite you to meet with me a man who was such an encouragement that his nickname was Son of Encourager. Let us read today in Acts chapter 4, where we are introduced to this man we know as Barnabas. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 7 says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means, say this out loud with me, Son of Encouragement. He sold a field and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called 
Barnabas. Now, here's the question. As I was thinking about this idea of encouragement, as we look at the life of one man and what it means, notice that as the church is beginning, it needs some encouragement. Now, I know when we read the Bible, we always read it from this side of of history, right? We see it from the completed, successful, look-what-they-did side. And so, we'll talk about the book of Acts, the story of the early church, and we'll say things like, oh, wouldn't it be great? To live in a time when the church is unified. And wouldn't it be great to be in a church where thousands of people are coming to faith on a regular basis? And by the way, I think that would be great, don't you? I'm so glad. But then, but then we read those first two chapters, chapter one and two, where the church is growing and blowing, and we read about how Jesus was crucified, buried rose from the grave, appeared to his followers for 40 days, and the church is thrilled, everything's going great. He then, for 40 days, visits with them and then ascends to heaven and gives them this command, continue the mission I have given you, which is to reach the next person for me. He ascends, the church is growing, but because the church is so excited and they're growing, they attract the attention of the religious leaders in Jerusalem who do not like that they are growing. And so, two of the church leaders, Peter and John, are arrested. They are beaten mercilessly, thrown in jail. And then upon their release, they are told, if you speak of Jesus anymore, we will do something far worse to you. The church experiences persecution, and the excitement dwindles as often it does. By the way, if you are new to faith, if you've just chosen to follow Christ, if you've put Jesus on in baptism, I want you to know something. You can expect, most likely, a season of excitement, but it will be followed by a season of discouragement because the enemy does not like that you are following Christ. And this would face the church. And so, Peter and Paul, you can imagine, they come back to that first group of followers still sore from the beating Wondering, how will this movement get through the first century, let alone beyond that, to cover the world that Christ called them to reach and to meet? And as they walk into that meeting, there in the group is Barnabas. But Barnabas is not alone. There, at the feet of the apostle, is the money that he made from selling his field. And he says, whatever you need for this, you use it. Can you imagine the encouragement that the church Felt. Now, this was no shock. After all, this was something they expected from Barnabas. He was this kind of man. You say, why'd they expect it? Well, they expected it because he did it all the time. He was such an encourager that they did not call him by his given name of Joseph. They gave him a nickname, Barnabas, encourager. And I was thinking about it this week. Here's a question for you. If you had a nickname based on your character, what would it be? Like if we were to pull the church audience and ask people who know you best, say, what nickname would you receive the one-word nickname of encourager or would it be discourager? Would you be given the nickname of blessing because you're constantly using your words to bless or are you gossip? Do you stir the pot? What would be the word to describe you? Because here's the thing, here's the thing, even if you don't have a spoken nickname, everyone knows you for something, and you know everyone for something, don't we? We all know people by some sort of characteristic, and here's how I know you know this. Because there are some people you will spend more time with, and other people, if you have the choice, you will choose not to spend more time with them. Hello, right? And so, because of this, if you think about what would be your nickname? After all, you can't give yourself a nickname. Well, I mean, I know people who've tried, and it's just weird, so don't do that. Don't like, they call me the all-star. It's just, it's awkward, okay? But you can get a nickname from other people. In fact, we had some deaf friends in Nashville who attended the Antioch Church years ago, and when I was there, they would, uh, you know, because they don't want to spell out your name every time they're talking to you, they come up with and will give you a nickname. So I had a nickname at the church in Antioch, according to uh, some of the deaf people. You want to know what it was? I'll tell you what it was. It takes two parts. First one is the letter J. Everyone just, you know, you do this, stick your pinky up like this, and you just kind of hook it up. That's J, okay, for Josh. But because Josh is the preacher, and I do this a lot, <clears throat> the nickname, by the way, this is the word for mouth, okay? So what they would do is they would go, Josh, mouth. J, mouth. That, that was my nickname. You're welcome. 
A friend of mine in college had a nickname, and by the way, it was always fun to know where people knew him from based on what they called him. Uh, So whenever you'd hear the name Andy, his first name, you knew that it was his sister or brother or someone who was close, like family to him. If you heard his last name of Martin, then you knew it was someone from his growing up years of middle school or high school. Hey, Martin! But if you heard this other name, because he was a stick figure, he was just a skinny guy, if you heard this other name, you knew where it came from. If you heard the nickname Skeletor, you knew that it was one of his frat buddies, because that was his pledge name, because he was so skinny. Again, you can't come up with your own name, but you're given a name based on who you are. So if you had a nickname, what would your name be based on your character? This is a question that, as Christians, we need to ask ourselves. And if you're like Barnabas, then the nickname is Encourager. Now, what we're going to see over the next few weeks is that Barnabas, encouragement, is not simply the words you say, but it's the things you do. And it's true that you can say something but live in a way that is discouraging, isn't it true? It's also true that you can live in a way where you're sharing and caring, but the words you say just constantly grate or cause hurt. And so we're going to look at how encouragement is provided in a variety of ways over the next few weeks through the life of Barnabas. But all I want to do today for the next few minutes is give you a sense of what does this idea of encouragement mean. And I want to begin with this definition, a very simple idea. Encouragement simply means you can do it, and I'm with you. Encouragement says you can do it, and I am with you. Isn't it true that our world is full of people who tell you you can't do it, and you're all alone? Encouragement says, no, you can do it, and I am with you. You say, why is this something we're going to talk about? Church, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ in a word. Because when you and I were sinners and everything was broken, Jesus Christ came on the scene and said, because He is with you, you now can be someone else. Amen? Because what Christ did when He entered human history, died for your sin, rose from the grave, proving that He conquers death, He then says, I am with you, and yesterday does not determine all of your tomorrows. Hear me. Whatever you brought into this room, the guilt the shame, the fear, Christ says, I am with you. And because He is with you, that does not have to define you, and you do not have to carry it out the door with you this morning. This is why it's so important. So encouragement, encouragement, what is it? It's you can do it, and I am with you. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about what encouragement looks like. A couple things this morning. Walt Disney, I love what he said. He says, Walt Disney said there are three types of people. The first kind of person is a well poisoner. A well poisoner. Well poisoners discourage you, stomp on your creativity, and tell you what you can't do. That's well poisoners. The second type of person Walt Disney said there are are lawn mowers. They are well-intentioned but self-absorbed. They tend to their own needs, mow their own lawns, and never leave their yards to help another person. They're lawnmowers. And then the third kind of person, these are the kind we want to be, are life enhancers. They reach out to enrich the lives of others, to lift them up and inspire them. So the question you and I have to ask ourselves is simply this, which one of those three am I? Which one of those three am I? Am I a well poisoner? When I'm around, people feel worse. Am I a lawnmower? People don't feel better or worse because I focus on me. Or am I a life enhancer that when I enter a space, I'm always thinking, how can I bless the people God has put in front of me? Now, there's a second question, though. It's not just which one of those am I, but am I different things to different people? Have you noticed that you can be a life enhancer to one person, but a well poisoner to another? I think about how sad it is so many of us, and I've seen this happen, where we are so encouraging to our coworkers, but we go home and we're discouraging to our own family members. It's like, oh man, why, are, why would we treat family, those we're closest to, worse than those that we work with? See, it's not just that you're one thing, but you can be different things to different people. Am I different things to different people? Now, as Christians, here's what we're called to do. And by the way, if you are not a Christian, here, this is great news for you. If you're not a Christian, I'm about to put a slide up, and you don't have to do it, okay? So if you're not a Christian, you get to sit back, cross your arms, smirk, and go, Stinks for y'all. I mean, you can do that, okay? But if you are a believer in Jesus, what I'm about to put up on screen is not a suggestion. It's not a good idea. It's a biblical command, meaning even if I struggle with this, I begin to order my life around what it says. 
Are you ready? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 5, familiar passage for many of us, but not for the reason it should be. Here we go. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Notice this. He says, what are you thinking about? When you enter a space, are you thinking, how can I be a motivator and an encourager to other people? But then this is the phrase we almost always focus on. He says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. See, a lot of us will read this and think, You've got to come to church. It's a Bible command. And yes, you should. Yes, you should. Of course you should. But he doesn't stop simply saying you should, does he? Now, how many of us, how many of us as parents, let's just be honest, how many of us as parents, when your kid asks you the question, why, you often give the answer, because. Or if you're feeling particularly chatty, you'll say, because I said so. And I love that the Bible doesn't do this. By the way, before I go on, though, I do want to say this. I do want to say this. Let's not neglect meeting together. Friends, I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. And if you're online, we are so glad that you're with us online. But hear me. If you are online, but you can be here, I'm going to ask you next Sunday, you be here. You come. Be a part of this. Don't give up the habit of being with Christians to encourage and to be encouraged. And here's the way you know if you can be here or not. You ready? Here it is. You can be here if you go other places throughout the week. If you go other places, then you can be here as well. And we want you here because we love you so much. But here's the reason that we get together. Are you ready? Here's the reason. But encourage one another. In other words, the reason we get together, friends, is to give heart to those who need heart. To say, you can do it. And I'm with you. But I can't say I'm with you if I'm not with you. You can't say you're with me if you're never with me. We as the body of Christ are better together. This is why you saw the video about missional communities. This group to get together whose commitment is a common mission to see people know Jesus but saying, you can do it and we're here to help. You can do it and we are in this all together. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. By the way, whose return is it talking about, church? Okay, 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 this was not a trick question. Let, let's just, okay, you're in church. The answer in church is always what? Yeah, it's like the little boy I've told you before, third grade boy, goes to Bible class. The teacher says, what has a big bushy tail, climbs trees, and eats nuts? And he thinks, man, it sounds like a squirrel, but I'm going to have to say it's Jesus, okay? So let's try to see again. Let's see. Especially now that his day, his day of return is drawing near, who is him that we're talking about, church? Wouldn't it be amazing if when Jesus comes back, you're in the middle of blessing someone? That you are so encouraging that when he comes back, he's like, whoa, at a boy, at a girl. This world needs heart, and you're giving heart. You're not taking heart. You are heart givers. You are encouragers. So, a couple applications this morning. By the way, before I do this, i got to just say, so there's a little clarity here. Some of you say, okay, wait, wait, before application, what is, what is encouragement not? Because some of us may be a little confused on this. Let me give you three things that encouragement is not. This is not in your notes, but it's on screen. Number one, encouragement is not supporting bad behavior. Okay? Christians are called to holy lives, to be different from the world. And this world has got its values upside down, where we now say what is evil is good, and what is good we say is evil. To encourage someone does not say everything you think or want to do is okay. We do not encourage people in actions that are destructive or disobedient to God. Rather, encouragement says you can become a different person through the power of Jesus, and I am with you to see that change happen. That is what it is. Encouragement is not supporting bad behavior. Number two, it's not lying. It's not lying. In the South, we call this being polite. <clears throat> Here's what I mean. Some of us will say, you can do whatever you want to do. You can be whatever you want to be. And all of us say, Pinocchio, your nose just grew. Because we do not live in a world where you can be whatever you want to be or do whatever you want to do. Friends, I would love to be a 250-pound linebacker for the NFL. Can I do it, church? You mean people. You say, no, Diggs, we're not trying to be mean. We just don't want to see you come next Sunday in a full-body cast. 
Encouragement is not lying and saying you can do or be something that you can't really do or be. But encouragement says you can be everything God created you to be. And I'll be with you through it. And number three, it's not doing everything. It's not saying yes to everything. Not saying okay to everything. How many of us are familiar with that fantastic, heavenly chicken restaurant, Chick-fil-A? Anyone? Mmm. Oh, now I get an oh yeah. Thank you. That's good. Chick-fil-A, one of these great restaurants that has just grown exponentially over the past 30 years. Why? Because they said we were going to focus on doing a couple things extraordinarily well. We're not going to be a hamburger joint. We're not going to be a seafood restaurant. We're not going to be the golden corral of fast food. We're going to focus on one thing and do it really, really well. Encouragement does not say to someone, we'll do everything you want to do. It says, we're going to do something extraordinary together, and you can do it with us. It's inviting people in. So application, are you ready? Application number one is simply this. Write the name of a person you know who needs encouragement, and then be an encouragement to them within the next three days. You say, why three days? Are you ready? Because if you're like me, you will forget to do it if you wait too long. And this is one of those things that is far too important to be forgotten. Now, here's the big question a lot of us come up with. You say, okay, Josh, I get it. So, encourage, fine, got it. The next question is, who? I mean, who needs this? Again, let's go back to Chick-fil-A. I love what Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, said. He said this, and it's so helpful. He says, how do you identify someone who needs encouragement? You want to know? He, that person is breathing. Isn't that true, though? Have you ever met someone who said, no, 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 I'm all full up on encouragement. Please don't give me any more. Have you met anyone who didn't appreciate a note that says, I know it's tough, but you're doing well? Someone who sits you down over lunch and says, I'm in this with you. Someone who calls you and just says, I was thinking about you. I hope you're doing well today. A text message that just says, it's going to get better. That, that front yard visit where maybe the person's nervous to be too close, so you just stand 10, 15 feet out in the yard and just say, I came out here to tell you you're not alone. If you're breathing, you can use encouragement. So if you don't know who to encourage, I'm going to give you a hint. Grab your phone, swipe through the contacts, and then put your finger on one. That's who you encourage this week. Because that person needs blessings to know that the God of the universe has sent you to them to say, don't lose heart. Church, we should be the most encouraging place in the world. There should never be someone who walks into this room who does not leave knowing that they are not alone. There should never be a group that gathers where people are not inspired to grow and take their next step in Christ's likeness. There should never be a gathering of believers where the name of Jesus is not celebrated, raised up, and the hope of Christ given to someone in that group. This is what we are called to. I don't want to ever, ever, ever hear someone say, I was not encouraged. Rather, what I love is when I'll hear new people who show up and I'll say, why did you come back? And they say, Diggs, it wasn't you. It was all the people who said, I am not alone. They, they put an arm around me. They invited me to lunch. They visited with me. This is when the church is at her best, when you are not alone, and the church says, you can do it, and I am here with you. That's the first thing. But see, listen, it's more than just saying generically you can do it. A lot of us say, maybe so, but I don't see a vision for my life. See, the other part of encouragement is that you call out the vision for someone's life. Parents, this is what you do whenever you tell your child, not what they did wrong, but who you see them becoming. And you begin to breathe truth into their lives, and you tell that daughter of yours, you are the daughter of the king, and he has given you a divine purpose in this world. I want more for you. You are going to do better. It's when you look at your son and you say, I know life is scary, but you are a warrior of light because God is with you. You step into the man that God is calling you to be, and you say, they can't even talk yet. You speak those words over your kids. Give them heart for the days to come. So it's not simply that you say generically, good job. It's that you speak truth to them. I love what John Maxwell says. He puts it this way. He says, people will go farther than they think they can when someone else thinks they can. Isn't it true that your coach, your teacher, your parent is the reason you did more, became more, did more than you thought you could? 
So maybe it's not simply call or write within the next three days, but maybe it also takes this next step with this next application. Write the name of a person who could do better if they were encouraged and put a 10 on their head. Say, what does that mean? You call out what is good in them. You call out who they can be. You do not call out the sin of their past. You call out the hope of their future. You call out who God has made them to be as a beloved child, a forgiven saint, someone who is made in the image of God, and you say, because of this, I know that your tomorrow is better than your today. I know that you can get to where God is calling you to go. And you call them and encourage them. I heard a story after the first service this morning that was so encouraging to me. We have a ministry here called Cry for the Broken where we help women uh, take their next steps leave the streets, find hope, find a home, encouragement. And one of our ladies told me of a story that happened that had its resolution just last night. A couple of years ago or more, uh, they this Cry for the Broken group, they helped one lady leave the streets, and they were going to send her to a place to, to start over. But they had to have a home for her for one night, and so they put her in the house of our sister here at the church, Gail Stokes. The woman who came off the streets, she was in a rough state, and it was a tough night for both of them. Well, she leaves. A year passes, and they start to reconnect, and this this woman reaches out to Gail and says, I just want you to know you've made a bigger difference in my life than you'll ever realize just from that time. And they began to talk, and her life has been turning around until, get this, last night she got married, and Gail Stokes was at the wedding reception. Why? Because someone said, you can do it, and I'm with you. Friends, this is what the church is, isn't it? Listen, I understand the church needs a Barnab or needs a Peter and needs a Paul. I know that, and we need a Mary. But I'll tell you the one thing I believe more than anything else we need today is we need a church full of Barnabases. Where it says, I'm not going to let you walk alone. And there's nothing you've done that's going to push me away. I'm going to lean in because Christ leaned into me. Friends, we have the hope of the world. Jesus Christ, may we be a church that gives that hope, that heart to those around us. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come to this moment of response, I pray that, Jesus, you would speak to each person. In a room this size, there are those who are on top of the world today. They've received good news or a promotion. Their relationships are reconciled or healthy. But the truth is, in this room and online, there are still so many of us who just say, I need someone to say it's not over. And I don't know if I can get down the road, but there's someone in this room, Father, I pray that you would encourage them and know that they don't have to figure out next year, but they can, through your power and the encouragement of your church, take the next step. May the nickname of this church be Barnabas. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.